Please like and subscribe to our channel and click the bell icon to get new video updates. So it was a normal day like any other. I woke up and I went to my favorite cafe and I got a cup of coffee. And while I was waiting in line for the coffee, I turned to my left and there was this box and it was filled with these little buttons. And I was curious, so I picked one up and I read it and it said, I talk to strangers. And I immediately threw the button back down because I didn't want anyone to see me holding that. I didn't want them to think that I wanted them to talk to me because of a huge fear of talking to strangers and I never do it. I think you should talk to a stranger if you know like your phone is broken and you're in an unfamiliar neighborhood and you've broken your leg and there's like a sudden tornado and only if all of these things happen at once. Otherwise, don't do it. And you know, I moved to London about six years ago from Beijing and I was super excited to get here because you know, England has all this green space but it also has all this personal space. And when I got to London, I, I liked that it was kind of a cold city and that people kept to themselves. You know, it's the kind of place where you can be walking down the street and fall down and nobody will bat an eye because they're, <laughs> they're too embarrassed for you and they just don't want to get involved. And I felt like, these are my people, like I found them. I identify as an introvert and, and I felt quite shy and I just feel like you don't need to talk to strangers. But that day with that button, I thought, why don't I talk to strangers ever? You know, we live in a city of almost nine million and I try to avoid all of them on public transport. And I think maybe I'll just wear this button and see what happens. And so I take the button and I sort of slip it in my pocket and I leave. And a few days later, I'm with my husband and I'm wearing the button and it's this beautiful sunny day in London and we're cycling and we're in this park and this man walks up to me and he starts like talking to me and I'm kind of like, okay, what? And he just gives me this really disappointed look and he says, oh, so it's not true. <laughs> and that's when I realized I'd been wearing the button and he saw it and I'd forgotten and he leaves before I can say anything to him. And this happens again and again throughout the day. And this whole time, my husband, who was English, had been watching and he just said, could you please just take the button off? Like, this is humiliating, just take the button off. And, and I agreed, like I sort of failed. So I took the button off and I thought, you know, I, I tried it, experiment over. And I was then on a plane from New York to London. And I did that thing where you find your seat and you put your headphones in and you sort of make your own space so that nobody talks to you. And you give that vibe of like, we're gonna sit by each other for seven hours, but like, we're not gonna talk to each other. <laughs> And this was fine because the two men who were sitting next to me, they turned to each other to chat. And I was sort of eavesdropping. And I noticed that they were talking about you know, where they were from and then they were showing each other photos on their phones and they were talking about their girlfriends and then they were comparing barbecue recipes. And by the time we landed at Heathrow, one had invited the other one to his birthday party. <laughs> and I was completely baffled by this. Like I had never seen this happen before and I started thinking, is this what I'm missing by not talking to strangers? Like, am I missing out on really good barbecue recipes and birthday parties? And so I decide, you know, maybe, maybe I could try this again. And so my first day of trying to talk to strangers, I walk up to this woman at the bus stop and she sort of feels me and coming towards her and she turns away because she thinks I'm deranged. <laughs> and then I get on the bus and it's about 8.30 in the morning, I'm going to work and I sit next to another woman and she's on her phone playing Candy Crush. And I'm looking at her phone and I'm thinking about what I can say to her. You know, we live in the same area, we're both going to work. And while I'm thinking of this, she looks at me looking at her phone and she shoots me this really dirty look and I just abandon the whole mission. <laughs> and I just think, I don't know if I can do this. And I get off and I just think, I'm just gonna go get a cup of coffee and, and figure this out. And I walk into another cafe I go to a lot and I'm about to order my coffee and I see that there's a new barista there. And I say, oh, you're new, when did you start working here? And he says, three years ago. <laughs> and I sort of take my coffee and I skulk away and I realize that I need help. 
I'm a journalist, and so I do have to talk to some strangers, but it's under the guise of a job, and so I can make myself do it. But um, also as a journalist, you get to call up experts if you don't know about a certain subject. And so I decided I would call an expert. And so I call up this man named Stefan, who lives in Boston. And he specializes in curing people of phobias, including social anxiety. And he tells me that the best way that he's found of curing people of social anxiety is to have them humiliate themselves again and again. And that is so that they can see that they don't get arrested and their spouses don't leave them and they don't get you know, fired and nobody you know, exiles them. And they survive, they just look a little bit silly. And he, you know, he says, well, sometimes I have like a really shy person stand in the street and sing. Or I'll have another one you know, go into the New York subway and ask 100 people for $400. Like your basic nightmare scenarios. <laughs> and I say to Stefan, what would you prescribe me? And he says, okay, so you're scared of talking to strangers and you're a little bit shy and you live in London, so I would have you ask strangers a really stupid question. And he says, here's your question and you can only say these words and nothing else. Excuse me, I just forgot is there a Queen of England? And if so, what is her name? <laughs> and he says that, you know, when I decide to do this, I can't, you know, just pick like friendly grandmas or, you know, people holding puppies and babies because that's called safety behavior and I won't actually cure my fear. And as soon as I hang up the phone with Stefan, I think, Thank God he's not my therapist and I do not have to do this because that would be terrible. And a few days later, I'm having lunch and I hear this voice in my ear and it's a man and he says, do you mind if I sit here? And I say, sure, go ahead. And he takes a seat and I'm looking at him and I'm thinking, this is my chance, you know, I can do this. And he puts his phone away finally and I just ask him where he's from and he says, France. And I say the first thing that pops in my head, which is, of course, are you offended by Brexit? And he's, it wasn't my best work, but um, I hadn't really thought through what I'd actually say to these people when I finally talked to them. But the conversation recovers and we have like sort of a nice chat and I leave feeling kind of good about it. And from then on, for the next few weeks, I start talking to strangers, you know, a little bit small talk. I talk to, you know, people on the bus about the weather or I'll talk to people who have dogs in the park or, you know, grandmas and their grandchildren, these things that I know Stefan would say are safety behavior. That's because whenever I have these interactions, I still feel that little feeling of trepidation that I'm still scared of talking to people that I don't know. And I know the only way to cure this. And so I'm standing on an underground platform and I'm feeling really nervous and I don't wanna do what I'm supposed to do and I don't think I can. And finally, I just decide to take the plunge. I'm just gonna do it. And so I flag down the first man I see when I decide. And he stops and I say, excuse me, I just forgot. And he looks at me and he goes, yes? And I say, is there a queen of England? And if so, what is her name? And he raises his eyebrows and he goes, the queen of England. And I say, yes. Who is she? <laughs> and he goes, it's Victoria. <laughs> and he gets on the train and he leaves. <laughs> and of all of the scenarios I had ever imagined, this was not one of them. And I'm so confused that I immediately flagged down the next person I see, which is another man in his 20s carrying a gym bag, and I say, excuse me, I just forgot, is there a Queen of England? And if so, what is her name? And he says, it's Victoria. <laughs> he gets on the train and he leaves. <laughs> and at this point, I am so confused. And, and I'm just thinking, does anyone know who the Queen of England is? Do I know who the Queen of England is? And finally, I recover and I ask four women in a row and they each tell me Elizabeth. And you know, some of them laugh and some of them think I'm a bit strange and 
One asks if I'm okay, but, <laughs> you know, none of them arrested me or, you know, my husband didn't leave me. I wasn't fired from my job. I survived. And I don't know what was going on with those men who were subjects of Queen Victoria. <laughs> I don't know if they were confused or if it's like a rule in England where if an American asks you a really dumb question, you have to lie to her. <laughs> Probably. But, you know, after that experiment, I realized that Stefan was right. You know, I haven't been completely cured of my social anxiety, but doing that experiment made me feel exhilarated. And now when I'm on the tube or the train, I do try to talk to strangers because I think it's nice. And that means that if you see me, I'm coming for you. And <laughs> we might have a chat, but I promise we'll both survive.